Divine Protection in the End Times, The Sign and the Mark. Yes, people all talk about the mark of the beast. Well, God has a mark for his people in the end times, and we're going to get into that. Some people talk about, well, just tribally, there are you know, 12,000 of each tribe, the 144,000. No, it's not just tribal. It's Revelation 7.3. It says it's the servants of God. And it says that God isn't going to hurt the earth until that his people are sealed in their foreheads. Not only says his people, but the servants of God. And we're going to go into what is that seal, and we're going to look at times that his people were sealed in previous chapters and prophecies in the Bible, and what it refers to in the scripture when it says you have a mark on your forehead, okay? In Revelation 9, 4, it says, And it is commanded that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any of the things in the earth, but those men which have the seal of God in their foreheads. And in Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, it says that we, the 144,000 which are sealed, have what kind of mark is, is on our foreheads? It says, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Yes, that's what it says. Revelation 14, 1, the 144,000 have his father's name written in their foreheads. So there we've given three different verses across three different chapters that talk about this sign in the forehead of the servants of God. Okay. And it goes pretty deep about the punishment coming upon the earth. It says that the rest of the people, they're going to wish that they would die, but they would be suffering so bad and would not die. But only the people who have the seal of God in their foreheads are going to be protected. So there is a lot of symbology about this throughout the scriptures, and it's really important, I think, to understand this all. However, notice that it's not just this knowledge, okay, but only the servants. It says, be not hearers of the word only, but be doers of the word. Some want to get through things by knowledge, and somehow they think that just somehow the serving of knowledge, even though they halfway barely understand it, they don't really get it in the heart, like Christ said, that I would heal them and, and forgive their sin. I would, he would have to if they were even halfway believing. But in the end time days, there's going to be so much abomination going on that it's going to be written in their foreheads, the enemy, okay? And what happens is that gets written in your head if it's not going to be God, okay? Because if you're watching things that go on, the abominations, and we're going to get into that. What it had to do with is, is if people were mourning about the abominations that were going on in God's original city, and in now the cities around the world, as it says, the cities of God would be spread abroad. And wherever it was, a Christian nation now being totally just raped, okay? And, and people have gotten hardness of heart, cold-hearted, numbed to the things going on. God sealed people, and it's actually, there's an actual prophecy of it in Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4, that a lot of, of churches that refer to, you know, when you get baptized, you get... Um, the sign of the cross on your forehead, okay? Or anointing, most churches are doing it with the sign of the cross on the forehead. And this is, again, the word for mark there. It's the word tau. It's the word for cross, okay? And in Ezekiel 9.4, it says that only the people who get that mark, are the only ones who are going to get that mark is when an angel perceives that they are mourning, Okay? mourning for the abominations that are going on in the midst of the city, okay? In the midst of thereof, of, throughout your city, okay? And only those people, the rest are going to be destroyed, it says. And they're not going to be spared. There's going to be no pity. It says 
the young, the old, maids and little children and women, they're all going to be shown no mercy by the, the destroyers, which will come and destroy. And on anyone uh, who does not have the mark, and it says they're going to begin at the sanctuary, and they're going to go throughout everywhere, throughout the land. Okay. So, he, like it says, the judgment begins at the house of God. If they're doing abominations there and not crying about the abominations, that's, of course, God's going to root them out first, right? If they have pride in sins, for example, some are celebrating sins. The only thing we should be celebrating in humility is God's word and glory and God keeping his covenant and his promises to his covenant people, which he said he would do. As his inheritance, okay, we are his inheritance, it says. And why does it say 12,000 out of each tribe gets sealed? Because, again, you're mourning because if you don't want the abominations, the word abomination means mix. Did you know that? If you could look it up in the Strong's Dictionary, we have it available on our site, CelticOrthodoxy.com. Just do the quick search for the word abomination in Strong's. So this is a mainstream Bible dictionary. You can get at any Bible bookstore. Full-blown mainstream for centuries now. In fact, all you have to do in our search bar there on CelticOrthodoxy.com just type in the word abomination, okay? And you'll find that the very first result is the Strongest Concordance Dictionary which shows it's the word Tau Eba, all right? It means mixed marriages or interracial marriage. This is, I'm quoting it exactly, okay? On the second line of the, of the definition, it describes abominations as being mixed marriages or interracial marriage. Of course, it's always been understood. 100% of the churches of all Christian nations were racially segregated, even to the ninth through the whole 1960s, up through the 70s, and in some states through the 2000s. All churches, 100% of them were racially segregated in the 1950s and 60s. We know that is a fact. Okay, it was even against the law. So don't anybody tell me that somehow this kind of thing about mixing is something, something God allowed. It's never been allowed. Okay, and there's plenty of Bible verses about it. The word for adultery and adulterate, where the word comes from for adultery, adulterate is also the word for interracial marriage and admixture. Is actually any kind of base or admixture is uh, is the word for adultery. So if people aren't crying and sighing about those, and then even worse, Sodom and Gomorrah, it says that in the book of Jude that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was actually going after strange flesh. And that's the reason God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Again, that word for strange is foreign. So the admixture, the, the kind of abominations, okay? And there's also abominations that make desolate, which is like when you want to mix genders. You want to say, well, they're a man and a woman. So again, that's another kind of, a, of, a, of admixture, adulteration, and abomination. And it says, when, the, when such an abomination stands in the holy places... You gotta be ready to flee, and it says basically flee, uh, be gone, get you know, run for the hills, which means kind of like leave that jurisdiction, be ready to just get out of that system totally. Like it says, an angel spoke and it said, Come out of Babylon, my people, that you partake not of her sins nor of her plagues. Yes, come out of Babylon, just like Paul said. Come ye out from among them and be ye separate. Again, he's quoting from the, you know, down in the, the Hebrew scriptures about being separate and a holy people. The word for holy also means separate. Okay. So why is it 12,000 out of each tribe? Well, that tells us a lot because in the New Jerusalem city, there's only 12 gates 
and each of the 12 gates have one name of one tribe over each gate, all right? Because only those tribes are going to be going through. And it doesn't say like, oh, one who's like uh, intermarried. No, it says one of each tribe. That's it. Because you see, God's law is clear on it. Even if you're an Israelite, a pure-blooded Israelite, you're, let's say, the tribe of Gad, and you go marry the tribe of Simeon, okay? It's not an evil sin, but it just says things like your first generation of, of those are not going to get inheritance. They're not going to be given inheritance. What you have to do is let it all go to your cousin instead of to your children, okay? You have a, let's say, it, that's the birthright lands that are to be strong for the next generation, for your tribe, okay? And God set it up that way, that now, okay, you want to uh, go out and take the tribe, which is in a, of a, a land that's been allotted in a different part of Israel, well, also, in the New Jerusalem city, there's going to be order, okay? And... It doesn't say, okay, we're not talking about if they married Esau, because if they married an es Edomite, right, then it says it's three generations till they can come back into the full congregation. They're banned. So it's not even that severe um, that, you know, and for ten generations, it says not even ten generations of admixture. If there's that far back, you have uh, bastard blood, which means, if you look up the word mamzer, it means a mongrel, where they're two different, totally different races. Not just talking about, um, you know, the Israel tribes, okay? But we're talking about total foreign, alien, the forbidden uh, tribes of the others, where Christ said, Enter not to the, any of the city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he said many times, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And you know, even call them dog races and things like this, where they are not of his children, he said. And this, these were just regular uh, people out there. Well, as you know, in that time, Ju Jerusalem was completely overran at 500 B.C. Judea was completely cleared out of Israelites, and only 30,000 returned back to that land after the Babylonian captivity ended. And so uh, it was surrounded by the Canaanites, the, you know, the enemies of the Israelites, and the Esau, Edomites, completely took over that land. So you didn't really have that many Israelites uh, at the time of Christ. I mean, you had one here and there. And then you had all the persecutions that came with, like, uh, let's say, Herod, his, his own sons. He was half Arab and half Edomite himself. He put his sons in as the temple priests, the Pharisees. And Christ called them out many times and says that they were not descendant. And he used very clear Greek words for genealogy. And he said that those Pharisees, like 90% of them, were not a genealogical descendant of Abraham through the covenant seed of promise. As it says, and Isaac shall thy seed be called. But they were from the Esau branch of Abraham because sometimes they would, they would invoke that they're their you know great grandfather was Abraham, but he would say that they weren't of the seed of promise, which was in Isaac. In Romans nine verse three and four, it says in Isaac or verse two in chapter nine of Romans that in Isaac shall the seed be called. Okay, you have the Anglo-Saxon and all the other derivations of our kindred nations have the word Isaac in the name of our tribal people. You can trace it all different ways, and you can find the name Isaac is in there. Okay, the most Christian people of the earth has ever seen, and have blessed the rest of the world with abundance. Okay, and have served the whole world. Yes, so the whole tribe thing is going to be perfectly kept, just like it says it's commanded to a thousand generations. And I think we've only Earth has only seen about two hundred generations since Adam. Uh, you know. That's a conservative number. But a, a thousand generations, and not only that, it says even after the new heavens and the new earth, not one jot or one tittle will pass from the law till all prophecies are fulfilled and all laws are fulfilled. 
And some of those laws have to do with the nation of Israel, the whole nation doing things. And it's going to be fulfilled when all the people do certain things together and you'll see it fulfilled. And not only all the laws getting fulfilled, but also all the actual prophecies, including the new heavens and new earth and the lion laying down with the lamb and all these, you know, things that happen. Then maybe we're looking at some jots and tittles. And after the thousand generations, okay, <laughs> then you could say those prophecies have been fulfilled. Till then, until after the 1,000 year reign of Christ and all this, and everyone celebrating his law, which is the true liberty, always was, and not trying to stay in the bondage of sin. First John chapter 3, verse 4 tells us sin is transgression of the law. People aren't going to want to do that anymore. That's the thing. When it's truly written on your heart, you don't want to do it. So that's what he's looking for, is the people who have his laws written on the heart. That means they have their emotions in it. That means they mourn for when the sins are going on so badly. Like David said, rivers of waters run down my eyes, for they keep not thy commandments. And as Paul said, day and night I warn them with tears. Okay. And it says he did that for three whole years straight, day and night with tears, warning them about the wrath to come. Okay. This is how believers are to warn people in love. And I'm sorry if I left anyone behind on some topics. I've covered some rich meat in a very quick way, covering even some theological questions you may have never heard before. But I guarantee you, any of these topics that I've just mentioned, we can cover it at length and show you there are no loopholes. These are strong points on every single word I said, especially if you want to talk about race or anything like this. Do send us a message. Let's get down to the bottom of things. It says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. So let's do it. We can have open questions and answers and get to the bottom of any question you might have. I have two doctorates in theology, and I would be uh, glad to put those to use to, to help you to go through you know, the, the thousands of hours that I've invested um, you know, so many days of going over 10 hours in theology studies, uh, going through the scriptures, okay, going through the Greek and the Hebrew, and really finding there is no private interpretation. These have been taught by thousands in every generation. This isn't any of my own interpretation. This is what's been widely understood by all. So we have a lot of material. We have so many books on the topics for example, of the pre-Adamic nations. This was taught by half of the church world. Really, when we talk about church world, God said in his word, the church, okay? His body of Christ, his body of believers. He wouldn't give us commandments to keep if it wasn't the best and the most easiest and most healthiest thing to do. What we got to do is stop being afraid and, are, and ashamed of his word. There are people who are ashamed of his commandments but it says he will be ashamed of you when he comes with his angels if you're ashamed of any of his word. And he is the word made flesh. John chapter 1 verse 14. As it says, he is from the beginning and by him were all things created. The eternal son of God pre-existing. And we don't even need to use all these dictionaries and so forth. I can show you just with King James, really any good, skillful person with the Word of God can show you comparison of Scripture with Scripture and show very strongly every point. Well, this is awesome truth. And His truth sets us free. Praise be to Him. You'll run into people who have an agenda to rebel and do not want to keep His commandments or laws, but serve their own flesh. And those kind, as it says, are not able to love the Father. It says, if you love the things in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, you have not the love of the Father, and that you cannot love the Father. You have to choose one or the other. So let's talk a little bit more about this having his mark in our foreheads, or his name in our foreheads. Again, in Revelation Another chapter, yet again, 
in chapter 22, verse 4, it says, And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Now, it says, okay, his name, right? Well, a name is the word character in the Hebrew, Shem, okay, character, okay. It's what you are, it's what you do. That's, that's what a name is. He says many times in his word, that you do not know me, and he that saith I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. The way we know him is by his word, his law, okay? And it says they who love him, they will lo keep his commandments, okay? So, I mean, knowing him and being able to see his face, coming before him, really it's going to also be with love, okay? It says, you go before his presence with thanksgiving and go into his courts with praise. That means you're not only <laughs> knowing, it's like you are celebrating what things he is and does and saying how great his law is. And it says, like, the Holy Spirit will magnify his law and make it honorable in these end times we're in. The true honor is his law. We will describe his greatness by his law, his love, his true love, okay, is his law. You can also look on our website, CelticOrthodoxy.com, for the word love, okay? And if you look it up in there, what's the definition of love? It says, by this you know that you love the children of the Lord when you love Yahweh and keep his commandments, okay? And that that is love, is when you keep when you love God and keep his commandments, that is the true love, okay? You're going to find it that he has the best way to live for us all. And you'll be celebrating it when you come into his presence. You're going to be talking about how great his law is, his covenants, his commandments, and all of his teachings, which, as it says, is to fulfill his commandments, not to rebel from his commandments, transgress his commandments, and so forth. Yes, we'll all make mistakes and sin, but he will help us as we daily do his prayer that he gave us and we return back to him. Yes, we go off his path of life and we fall down anytime we fall in sin and fall short of the glory of God. But we are to go into his presence. You will have a bit of his glory when you do. And you're going to know how close you are with him is when you're thankful of him and what he's doing. So you're going to get his word hid in your heart that you may not sin against him, as David had said. And how do you get it hid in your heart? You memorize it. Then you meditate on it. You think on it. You get the understanding of it. Then you get the feeling of it. Then you have the emotions of it. And then you just love it. Okay, that's when it's written on your heart. Is That means you truly love it so much. His laws are, should be your delight, like it says David delighted greatly in all of God's commandments, and Solomon too, and also in Paul and all the other people in the scripture. They all talked about the wonders of his word. His word is the law. And I'm not just making that up. It says that dozens of times in the scriptures that the word is the law. Okay, And when it talked about the word, they were talking about the law. His good law for us to live, it says, for us to thrive, for us to prosper. And when they don't have his commandments, they suffer. And there's a lot of scriptures even about punishment when there's rebellion from his commandments. And this is why there's coming the great punishments on the earth. But if we turn with our hearts fully to him and convert, he will forgive and he will help. For those who truly do from their heart uh, say look I'm going to keep the Sabbath now I'm going to do Bible study I'm going to take time off from work and I'm going to study and I'm going to worship and I'm going to not do my own pleasure but do his pleasure and work on his things that he would have for us to do in, in the earth like he told us to pray his kingdom come and his will be done in the earth and it says we're to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and then all these things will be added unto us so if we're seeking after the things and the necessities of the things in life, it says you're not going to find it. But if you seek him, you will find everything else you might need. And anytime the word kingdom comes up, you're going to have always the law there. 
you're going to have his nationalistic laws. Actually, three quarters of the laws in the Bible are dealing with national level applicable. They don't even apply to personal. And if you're going to want and you're going to seek first his kingdom, you're going to be seeking first his laws. Okay. Which have to do with nations, which has, has to do with a kingdom, his kingdom, or the cities of God spread abroad, as it says, which will have places of safety. Also, you'll have homes, which are like little Zions all around the world, it says. And there will be a cloud covering in those end time days, and that you will be divinely protected. When you choose him and you choose his laws for your life, and you renew your minds in his word, you're being transformed into his image. So again, the thing about the forehead, uh, I want to get into a little bit more. And that has to do with what you place before you. Okay. It says, set no evil thing before you. Okay. Um, There are people who will watch whatever wicked evil thing comes on their computer screen, for example. Abominations being celebrated, for example, you know, things like this, bad teachings and so forth, and po- even pornography, okay? Things like this that people are just allowing to come on the screen. They're not sighing for Jerusalem. They're not crying. They're not mourning. It says, they who will be comforted in Zion are they who mourn, and he'll give you beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. He comforts them that mourn. That's one of the blessings when you mourn. Then you'll be comforted. So the thing that you pay attention to the most, it's at your forehead, right? And there's a lot of scriptures about that. It says, for example, there's the Shema Israel liturgy that every Hebrew home would do. And Christ called it out as the greatest commandment. He said, well, what is the greatest commandment? He said, Shema Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord thy God is one. That's, again, quoting exactly the the home liturgy that every Hebrew does. And when they gather together, that you're saying, you're going to respond to his word. Okay, and that goes on. That passage goes on a little bit longer, and it gets into the word about having between your eyes, having his commandments between your eyes. Well, how do you do that? Well, it's also says have it on your arm. It says have it on your doorposts of your house, upon your gates. Speak of them when you sit in your home. So most of them, the, if you look at most of them, they're talking about talking about his commandments, praising his commandments, teaching his commandments thoroughly to your children. It says when you sit in your home, when you walk on the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You know, and then it talks about bind, binding on your arm and hand. And there are different traditions I've heard people say about reminders, any kind of reminder of his word or his law. Or reminder of Christ, because Christ is the whole word, okay? And hearing him, as in the Anglican Church, the the uh, midday and uh, um, the communion service has the words, Hear, O Israel, right there in the liturgy. We know where Israel, British Israelism, has always been uh, with the full knowledge. There's thousands of books on the topic that the Anglo-Saxon and kindred tribes of the world are the true Israel of God. We have hundreds of marks of Israel where we fulfill the Bible words of exactly only one type of person on the whole face of the earth have ever done this. One of them I like, of course, I always quote, is that from the corners of the earth, that we would occupy the corners of the earth and bring his word there, his law, and that's what we've done. If you want to look down to South Africa, you want to look to the other corner of the earth, and let's say the tip of Canada, or right? if you want to look at Australia, if you want to look at all the corners of the earth, really. Even the east coast of Asia, something like three quarters of that is, is white Russia, who brought Orthodox Christian law of God there. Like it says that the there are certain tribes would just which would just go northwest, but then there are certain tribes that go east, west, north, and south. That is of his true Israel. It gives us all the descriptions of who they are and what they are. And it's very clearly proven who each of the tribes are today among the Christian nations of the earth. 
So the more and more you get to celebrating and knowing him and knowing his word, knowing his law, not as one of those who says, where he says, depart from me, I never knew you. You who work lawlessness, that's a different person. Where he doesn't even know you. Not only you don't know him, but he doesn't know you. Okay, there are some who are going to fall in that camp and they're going to be very surprised because they called him Lord, Lord, and they did miracles and things even. But you know, if they didn't have his word or his law, they don't know him. And it says, normally they don't know him, but there's no light in them and no truth in them. They who say they know God, they are liars and there is no truth in them if they don't keep my commandments. So as long as you're converted and you're trying, he looks at he looks to that. Okay, you don't have to be perfect from day one, but you're being transformed by the renewing of your mind in his word. And with your all your heart, you're seeking and renewing your mind and being cleansed. Sanctification. Everybody has to go through it. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we all will work towards his work of sanctification. And as Paul put it in uh, 2 Thessalonians 5, sanctify wholly your whole spirit and your soul and your body. Okay. And may it be preserved blameless to the coming of the Son of God. Okay. And it says we are to pray and watch continually, praying and watching that we may be worthy to escape the things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. So a big part of this is you're going to have your forehead or your face, okay, is looking to his word. You're having his law between your eyes. This is on your forehead, okay? And it says that this is part of the greatest commandment Christ gave. You're not going to be marked with only looking at horrible things. If you're like, for example, a big social media user and you've got a lot of friends who are sharing gory stuff, sick stuff, sick jokes, which are not jokes, okay? We should be, we should be, shaming and and upset it says they who sigh in his cities will be sealed and that he will protect us if you are truly sighing okay and i know that if you in many for example facebook you can't share your religious or spiritual views without getting banned so you might just share certain things uh, to, to say like how, you know, your friends know that you would be upset about it. But even that's not enough. We got to get out of that whole system of, you know, entrapping us and keeping us in these bubbles. Okay. The echo chambers, as some call it. And that's what we try to aim to do. You know, you can use our website, CelticOrthodoxy.com. We have book clubs. Where we organize at local levels. The British Israel Book Club is a, is a great one where you have discussion groups and you get together with folks who don't yet know all the kingdom truths. But this is a good starter point. You know, if they believe in Christ and they're going to be interested, you, you can just organize your own local uh, book club. The name British Israel is descriptive. It's not an organization. It's not a religion. It's not a faith. It's not a name that has to do with any kind of organized religion you are british israel okay british actually covers a number of different tribes and it says that the ephraim branch which are the lead of the tribes of israel have to represent about a dozen of the israel tribes you can uh listen to my message the british israelism understanding where i go into that a little bit more in depth but then you start to find out why God is so great in his laws, even his laws to be separate, how wonderful it is and good it is and how healthy it is and how it is the best way to think and live and know in the most peaceful way, the most prosperous way, everything good about it to celebrate him. And then we have seminars, how God's law is scientific, how it is the best. Okay. Seminars on creationism. All of these things we can really bring about to bring people to have a closer and deeper walk with Christ. Because look, we really are going to have to pray for a miracle in this generation. It says at the end times there will be a great falling away of the truth. Okay, and people will become cold hearted and things. But we got to pray there's a turnaround because at some point 
if people are so cold-hearted and there are abominations being pro- promoted in the holy places, it says that's when you know that end has come. And it says no one should really wish for that great day of the Lord. It's the great and terrible day of his judgment, the day of his wrath. Okay, And we're going to really hope and pray people aren't with that. But you know, if we do love him, it says the servants of God are going to get sealed on their foreheads. And that's a good news we have. And so I just wanted to share a little bit of that understanding with some of the remnant and elect out there that you can be comforted. So be encouraged. That's what it says about Revelation in the book of Revelation, that you, if you understand that you're encouraged by it. And I just want to share a little tidbit as well about the word God and the word Elohim, okay? It, Basically, the word God in, in Hebrew is Elohim, and it boils down to whatever moves you in your behavior, that's your God, okay? And our God should be what moves us, not the world, okay? And it says, if you hate not the things in the world, you cannot love me, okay? Really, it, it says that in many different ways, okay? It says, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. This is what Christ said, okay? It says it's better for you to go into heaven with only one eye than it is for your whole body to be cast into the lake of fire. And sure, it says he does fulfill all the needs of our heart. And But when you agape, when you, when you place this unconditional love of things in the world, you see, where you put those things first instead of God's law, that becomes your God now. If, if something, and that's the word for idolatry. So again, part of the Shema is not to go a whoring after the, after the eye, after the flesh, the lusts of the eye, it says. Because that's what happens. It's called the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Those three things are what's in the world. And if you have a love of the world, you have not the love of me. So this is what happens is we go a whoring after idolatry. Okay, that's the word for idolatry and going after other gods. Is when your own flesh becomes your god. It says your god becomes your belly even. Okay, and what that means is that if your flesh comes first where it makes you transgress God's laws and you don't mind that it, you'll just sacrifice anything for that particular thing, which means, you know, going against his word, going against his law. But we are not to be moved, okay? And I want to encourage you, do not be moved by what you see. It says we walk by faith, not by sight. It says faith comes by hearing in hearing by the spoken word of God. See, the tongue moves quicker. It says that the word of God is quick and powerful, even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. That's pretty fast, if you ask me. That's a fast thing. And that's what we need. It says the eyes are slow. It sees only what happens afterwards. Okay? And that's our spirit is alive and active, quick and powerful. Okay? And that's what we are. We have a quickening spirit. Okay? And so we are just in this slowness where it says that, um, you know, there's a ton of verses about this. So I just want to encourage you to continue on and walk by faith. Faith comes by hearing, okay? Not by sight, which comes later. It it will come to pass. Everything that God has promised, you will see it, including he will give you pleasures evermore at his right hand and that you are presently seated with him on his throne right now. And that you're getting more than you could ever need or want. Like it says, if you seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and again, on earth as in heaven, and if you ask me, they're doing it pretty good in heaven, but you're just supposed to seek it. That will be done on earth too, okay? His kingdom, his will, his law, his word be done on earth as in heaven. And as you do, it says, then ye shall have all the necessities of life added unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, then all these things will be added unto you, okay? So we're looking forward to celebrating with you. Do reach out if there's any way, you know, or any prayer requests you may have, anything you want to do to work together. We have a global ministry. If you're in any part of the Western Christian nations, Definitely there's something we can do for you and we can work together. Take care and may God bless you. Bye-bye.